Now for late stage cancer drugs, treatment tends to be about improving quality of life or extending life. How does that impact on the outcomes data that you need versus perhaps less serious, more chronic disease areas? I think it's, it's evolving. Um, I think the, traditionally the gold standard approach was, was overall survival for your primary endpoint um, in pivotal trials and I think now more and more in oncology we're seeing PFS um, as the, the endpoint and accepted um, as the primary endpoint uh, in pivotal trials for oncology. Um, I think this is hugely positive because it shows an acceptance in the shift towards chronic treatment and chronic management um, as opposed to short-term term goals with, with patients in cancer that have very poor prognosis um, and limited lifespan. So it's, it's very encouraging, um, but it's challenging in a way because it's, it's complex to have PFS as a primary endpoint. Um, and it's difficult to try and manage um, biases in uh, clinician viewpoints about what constitutes progression um, and to try and minimise that and get some standardisation across your clinical trial centres is, is quite challenging. Um, and on the back of that also you've got the regulatory issues whereas the majority of regulatory bodies see, see, they still see overall survival. Um, as the, the primary endpoint that needs to be achieved in order to achieve your FDA approvals or your approvals in the UK. So that's quite challenging. It's, I think the, the shift has happened from a clinical perspective, um, but from regulatory, it's, there's still quite a bit of work to do to ensure that they accept PFS as, as a good primary endpoint. And what impact can specialist prescribers or payers have on the access to novel oncology treatments for patients? I think their impact can be, can be huge. I think um, they play a very important role um, in speaking to individual patients about their needs and requirements um, and then collaborating all the information they get to create a stronger voice that can impact um, not only payers but policy makers as well. Um, and I think there are, you know, numerous examples where patient organisations have had a, a strong input um, into the um, availability of products for certain cancers. Uh, and I think there's still a long way to go. And I think pharma need to collaborate more closely um, with patient organisations to ensure that the, the unmet needs and the patient needs are heard and, and profiles are raised, in particular for cancers. Um, where perhaps um, the PR has been poor in the past or there is very little understanding and awareness of it in the, in the public domain. In what cancer types do you see the most progress being made at the moment? I think across the board there have been um, clear uh, data that's been presented over the past, well, 10 years really, that show huge progression um, in the treatment and management of cancer. Um, there are obvious examples um, in the last 10 years, uh, breast cancer for example, with the introduction of Herceptin for HER2 positive breast cancer patients, um, I think really set the scene for personalised medicine and targeted agents um, and that had a huge impact on, on patients' life and, and survival. Um, I think more recently, uh, I would say over the past five years, uh, lung cancer and the treatment of lung cancer um, has progressed um, hugely. And I think, you know, the, the patients, the majority of patients that are diagnosed with lung cancer are diagnosed in the advanced stages. Um, the five-year survival rate is very poor, at less than 15%. And there's a huge unmet need in this patient population. And I think the advances that have been made in the identification of biomarkers, understanding more about the histologies, um, have directed a huge amount of activity in clinical trials. The incremental improvements that have been seen over the past five years in the clinical trials for lung cancer, in particular non small cell lung cancer, um, in comparison to the larger tumour types may not be seen as hugely advantageous. Um, but when you look at the patient population you're dealing with, um, the limited treatment options they had five years ago, um, it's, it's hugely um, positive now, the options that these patients have. Um, and certainly it's having a major impact on their quality of life um, and slowing down the progression of their disease which is, is, is really, really impressive in this patient group.
And where do you see the biggest challenges remaining across oncology at the moment? I think the uh, challenges that, that we've discussed will, will remain moving forward. Um, I think looking into the future from a UK perspective, um, I think the survival rates and the outcomes for patients are poor compared to the rest of the world, which is concerning. Um, it's no coincidence to learn that the expenditure in UK on cancer drugs is minimal compared to the rest of the world and the uptake of new targeted agents is um, slower as well. Um, I think those things can be improved but I think it will take a collaboration of both uh, well, clinicians, industry, regulatory bodies, patients, patient groups um, to ensure that the advances that we've made in um, the understanding of uh, cancer and cell biology can be translated into clinical practice and then ultimately um, we can ensure that patients get access to the medications uh, once they're on the market. Sally, thanks very much for your time and your insights. Thank you.